Welcome to PLZ Soccer's podcast. I'm Peter Martin. Delighted that Ruffy and Tam Cowan are with me yet again this week. And we've got a special guest, as always. And it's a man, would you believe, who's won every medal in Scottish domestic football. I know, Ruffy, you'll be aghast at that. But uh, not only the second division and the first division, but the Premier League, the League Cup and the Scottish Cup. I give you the one and only Frank McGarvey. What a medal haul that is, Frank. The memories must be flooding back on every one of them. Yeah, it was amazing the wee skinny guy from Easter House could um, win every medal and I'm, I'm very happy that I've done that. It just, just shows you you can do whatever you want in life and uh, and I hope that gives other um, younger players, um, you know, uh, that you can do these things. Yeah, I think the great thing about you coming here, it's a it's a real trip back to the old school guys because uh, Frank's come in, he's smart, he's got the waistcoat, he's got the tie and obviously because we knew you were coming in, Frank, um, Tam Cowan has decided to wear uh, the Simon that he bought in 1985 <laughs> uh, when you won the Scottish Cup with Celtic and Ruffy, no less, Tam has got a new haircut which is drastic. It's to excellent, least, it's it? excellent. I mean, this is, I honestly, I always got a wee buzz Whenever you bump into guys like Frank, because this, this for a guy my age is like sitting next to a panini sticker uh, with legs, because you just think, Frank, wow, well, when I was growing up, when you were first getting interested in football, he's the sort of guy that you would be right into. It was a household name, same as a gentleman to my left as well, and it's uh, it's terrific. And I think it's just always a shame that, um, that guys like Frank, who had been there and done it, um, boys knew who I would say couldn't lace his boots or guys who couldn't pull on a pair of gloves like him and uh, just get an embarrassment of riches uh, you know whereas did you get the bus out here the day Frank eh? yeah can I just can I just put in there I'll just I'll just like to say that the Panini stickers Aye. that we were on we get a cheque every year for five pounds is that it? Yeah. a fiver to give your image now their image rights is such a huge thing now yeah. can you imagine Cristiano Ronaldo getting a fiver <laughs> uh, to get his posters put you up mentioned or whatever, you, you, know? you mentioned that to us Ruffy didn't you you get a fiver as well you didn't believe that when I told uh, you, uh, that you that's that what to it, and, and you had to sign a contract you had what? to sign a contract to say that you couldn't do anything else with any other uh, firms. Or the good thing about it, from Frank's point of view, your Panini sticker didn't really change. It was just that big, um, you know, the the the, the, big, hair. the big crystal tips style hair, and then your face didn't change. Uh, the big man here, I pulled out a Panini sticker that I found in a box the other day there, and you looked like Ron Jeremy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember yeah, that? Yeah, I remember face? it as clear as anything. Yeah, I think that I just started to sort of a grow the perm out. So it was one of these in between ones when it. Uh it was. It, it, you're right. You know, I could have been run. I yeah. wouldn't mind being him actually. Yeah. Uh, and to be perfectly <laughs> honest, I, I thought you were him. <laughs> <laughs> and for the benefit of our younger <laughs> listeners and viewers, look up Ron Jeremy. It's as simple as that. Um, well, listen, Frank. The other great thing about it, uh, you've got a hall of medals. You obviously. You know, won all the medals with Celtic, but is the St Mirren one special for you? I mean, you started your career there. Did you not go well, back and win it uh, again against Dundee United? Well, to, to be honest with you, it was the both times I was with St Mirren that I won a trophy. The first time was the first division under Alec Ferguson, yeah. and uh, the second time was the 87 Cup final. We beat Dundee United, who were rated 15th in European football at the time. So that's how high the standard was then in the 80s. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible, actually. And Aberdeen were higher than them, Frank. They were about ninth, I think. Yeah. And yeah. Can, I, can I let you mention Alec Ferguson without telling us one story about him? What was the one thing you'll always remember about being in the dressing room with him? The one thing I always, um, I always remember, uh, he was an expert at getting the most out of you. And every game that I played, I was very enthusiastic about every game I was in. Um, and we were playing in D United in a cup game and I couldn't get myself going. And he knew that. And um, he came up to me, we were playing in D United at um, Love Street. He came up to me and said, Frank, come here. I said, what is it, boss? And he says, uh, I was talking to Jim McLean there. He says, you're effing hopeless. Oh, I said, oh, did he? And that got me riled up. We went out, we won 4 1. I scored a goal, made a few goals, played out my skin. That's how good he was. He would look at each of the players and always try to get the best. And it, if he never said that to me that day, 
I would have played a stinker, but yeah. he he knew how I operated. Yeah, it's and a it, trick it, worth trying. So for the sake of Peter and indeed PLZ Soccer, Ruffy, seeing these postcards, you've been fucking useless. <laughs> by the way, get your finger out, all right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I was going to say, honestly, the total difference in personality because you, coming from Easter House, uh, somebody says something to you, Oof, you know, uh, you're, you've got a bit between the yeah, teeth. But he's, uh, he did, he, that's me and Michelle now. Yeah. I'm not no, no, I was going to say, if Frank if Sir Alex Ferguson says to Ruffy, by the way, Ruffy, you are hopeless. Jim McLean thinks you're hopeless, Ruffy. And I went, Oh, ah, so I, yeah, is that right? And then <laughs> we're in a Walter Tim. Yeah. But you know what? It's a different model because there you go, whatever. And we, we keep hearing the stories about us uh, guys who are had a, as incredible a career as you, and the same we're off in that. You, you know, they'd been good plumbers and joiners. It might be stayed up the street for you. It might have actually still had a better week than you financially. The players now. Would they react to totally different? You imagine a manager, you know, trying the hair dryer treatment or whatever like Alec did, or shouting effing and being at players to try and jeer them up. It just wouldn't happen now. No, no. Who, who, who are you talking to? You know? You're That's absolutely right, Tam. Right. The other thing I was going to say to you, and, and, and I don't know if you're aware of this, Tam, but I mean, you would have been a millionaire in today's uh, game because I, I think every time I think about you as a player, I always think maybe just that wee lack of patience when you got the move from St Mirren to Liverpool because the, you know the people who did wait and bide their time in that Liverpool side you know they went on they won two three European Cups well um, I used to speak to Graham Souness and Terry McDermott and the two of them said Frank we waited two and a half years each to get into the first team he said and when you get into the first team it's a lot easier he said you've got to be patient I said but I'm playing in front of two and three hundred people every week where when I was at St Martin I was going to Ibrox and playing 40,000 people in Parkhead 40,000 people and I loved that yeah. the more people a game the better for me and I was I was I thought at the time this is no good and to be honest Alec Ferguson phoned me every week but not to tap me then he was only phoning me to to see how I was and he, he used to ask me things I always remember him asking me what do you think of Mark McGee I think he was at Newcastle at the time you think I should buy him I said he's a great player get him you yeah. know but he was he was just waiting for me to say I have to go and um and that eventually happened when I thought I should have been put into the first team when David Johnson got injured and they put David Verkloff I'd, I'd been playing all year with him and I'd scored a lot more goals than him and they put him in front of me and I was very, very unhappy at that. But Bob Paisley was a brilliant manager. Liverpool were a brilliant football team there. The, the scouting system they had, they were European champions. People forget when I went to Liverpool, they were European champions at the time. Yeah. And people were saying, how did you know get into that team? Well, I wasn't going to replace Kenny Douglas anyway so it was between me and David Johnson and David Johnson scored 38 goals that season yeah. but, but financially I mean okay the lure of Liverpool from a football player's point of view going to European Championships a great club that must have been magnificent but I'm guessing that going for St Martin to Liverpool it must, they must have made it really worth your while right I'll tell you even what in happened. the terms then I'll tell you what happened then I went down to Liverpool I was sold for £270,000 I got 5% of that money which was, I think it's 5% of that, but it was about 12, 12 grand. grand, just say 12 grand, and I was on £425 a week at the time, which was a very, very good wage at the time, so I was more or less get £13,000, and um, I had, I sold my house, so I had about £14,000, and we were buying a house in Formby, and I could buy it cash, and I said, brilliant, and uh, I went up, and then I got my wages that week, and uh, it was £13,500 top line. I was like, oh my goodness, this is unbelievable. And I looked at the bottom line, £2,500. Uh, I said, what happened there? And I went up to see Peter Robinson, who was a, another brilliant guy at Liverpool. And he was the accountant. I said, Peter, this is, I don't understand why I've only got £2,500. He said, it's 83% tax, Frank. So after £400, you're taxed at 83%. And I nearly collapsed. Uh -huh. Wow. Oh God, that's unbelievable gut wrenching. Nearly collapsed as well. <laughs> <laughs> By, the <laughs> By, <laughs> By the way, the group Queen at the time had to leave Britain because they were paying so much money to the tax. They had to leave and go into another country. There was a documentary I watched a few weeks ago about that, and I was like, oh, "Wow, they were the, they were the same. They were getting taxed the same as me." Yeah. Now this is a. I, I know we've 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 chatted about it before, but Tam hasn't heard it, and Ruffy and I loved it. Um, you know. 
know, when you go to Liverpool, there's so many stars there, but he hasn't heard the Phil Neal story. The Phil Neal story is legendary for us, well, and he'll love it. Well, um, you didn't like him. All the players at Liverpool, I loved them all, but Phil Neal was the right back at the time, and I was I shouldn't have been put into the first team dressing room. I should have been in the second team dressing room because I was playing for the second team. But Phil Neal didn't like me in that dressing room. I don't think he liked Scottish people in general, and um, and I went into the bath one day, and Phil Neal came in, and Terry McDermott, and Graham Soonis were there, I was just having a wash, and. Um, and I picked up a piece of soap and um, started washing myself uh, down with it. And Phil Neal said to me, uh, Frank, that's my soap, you can't use that. I said, I don't see your name on it anywhere. And he went, that's my soap, give me it over here. So I wiped, I cleaned my behind very, very thoroughly and I threw the soap to him after it. And he got up to punch me in the face and Terry McDermott and Graham Soonis got up and split the two of us. I was ready to punch him and uh, uh, and they managed to stop the fight. If it wasn't for the two, one of these would have been lying in that pool. Wow. <laughs> it's, a great, it's a great story. Here, there's your name. Fire I have it. A- That's yours, Phil. Um, listen, uh, you talked about the money on it. Uh, I mean, at St Mirren, the money must have been unbelievably different. What were you on there? I went to St Mirren from Celtic. I was actually making good money at St Mirren at the beginning. Aye, what, were you on, what were you on at St Mirren before you joined Liverpool? Before I was on £150 a week plus double bonus. And what year was that? That was 1979. Now, what at were the you time, on in 79? Uh, 79, 170. That was at Thistle. Ah, and that was, only, that was only because Alan <laughs> Hansen went to Liverpool. That as soon as he went to Liverpool... Obviously, you had to go in and say, "Hey, come on, I'm the should be the biggest, highest player now." I was only international city team. Yeah, so well, well, you were probably the best paid player in Scotland then, because I was talking to Dixie Deans, and he said at the time in 1978 he was on 65 pounds a week at Celtic, and Bobby Lennox said he was on 85 pounds a week. Is that right? Well, there you are, Ruffy. That yeah. just gives Change you a wee days. indication. It is. What 80 was it? Bobby Lennox, a lot has been lying, 85 pounds a week. Yeah, man. What was the first car you, you ever bought? The first car I got, I saved up money. I was a joiner, apprentice joiner with Glasgow Corporation. Saved up 90 pounds and I, the chance to get this wee mini minor. And um, I went and bought it. Uh, 90 pounds took it out my third drive um the engine blew up and uh, i had to get a guy put another engine in it and uh, he done that and it lasted me about a year um but after that i won it's i went to st man and i won for being player of the year i won a sunbeam a, a, a sunbeam talbot <laughs> oh I Ruffy, won a, look at ruffy's face i know i won that a white one oh what a cracker so that was my first car which was a letdown and then i got a car for nothing so i can't complain yeah Ruffy. yeah my first one was a sunbeam rapier rapier uh, my which god is sort of a the jazzy sort of a saloony bit yeah uh, well i don't know much it was that would attract the, the women truth. i would think plus your blonde hair well <laughs> 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 I'm, glad, I'm glad you narrowed it down to those two things, Frank. No, well, obviously, you know, you've got to, you know, accept that uh, some cars suit, but some people, some cars don't. Yeah, yeah. my Absolutely. first was a Ford Pubix. It was uh, made for old Corsairs. <laughs> <laughs> I knew, I knew right away. He'd be, I could see the wheels. It's car joke, I know. It's fine. <laughs> uh, what you know was what? See, Frank, though, eighty-five pound a week. That does, you know, that has your eyes popping out your head. But for right, good top-end tradesmen um, at the time, Frank, you know, it was, a, it was the the guys. I said to Ruff earlier, they were all kind of the same money. The football hadn't exploded. There wasn't the superstars. There wasn't the super wages. And I, I think, you know, and maybe it's just a wee bit of nostalgia, and, that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. But it must just have been a better time to play your football. You'd have done it mainly for the enjoyment. Yeah, I don't know, Frank. Frank again. Like, yeah, I don't ever remember uh, at any stage thinking about money. Aye. I mean, I don't need. I don't even remember uh, thinking about. Oh, I need an extra twenty quid here or thirty quid. I was playing every week. And I was enjoying it, and as Frank said, everything that came with it. Starting pals. training in the morning, finishing at half twelve, and I don't mean the life. guys, your teammates. See your pals at the time. What were they doing? What sort of jobs did they have? Oh, they'd have been plumbers, electricians, exactly. you know, things yeah. like and that. And you're out you know? there playing football exactly. and all that. But you had a trade, Frank. You, were you a joiner before you got into the game? Uh, I was. Uh, I asked. Um, 
Alec Ferguson wanted me to go full time, and but he said to me, "You're in your last year. I join at that time. You had to do four years, um, to get your sitting guilds." And uh, he said, "He said you're you're doing okay part time. Um, so just stay, um, and get your joinery trade because they might come in handy later on in life." And how true the words were, and um, and I, I was I was part time, um, in nineteen seventy nine playing for St Martin 1978-79 and I was uh, the top goal scorer in the first division but I trained I really trained very very hard yeah. and I was extremely fit and I tell out all the young boys you've got to be an athlete before you become any kind of sportsman yeah uh, um, the other thing about it as well is you know started off with mentioning all your uh, your medals you've uh, been top goal scorer uh, you had a uh, a, a Chrysler Sunbeam. Is there any any, night, any nightmares? Your your whole life's like Dorothy and, and the Wizard of Oz at the moment. I have to I have to say that I agree with Ruffy there. At that time, we never bothered about money. We just wanted to go out there and play football to the best of our ability and give the fans something to cheer about. Yeah. That was so important to the players. The fans were going out. They were earning their money, good money they were earning, and they were coming to the football clubs and giving to the football clubs and the players were going out there all the players that I've ever played with gave 100% I can't really say that about all the players now I, I, I watched an Arsenal team the other night and I tell you I would say three or four of them weren't trying. Yeah, right. Right. yeah. Here's no, a good, and I hate to say that. Here's a, here's a good point. You, you you mentioned all the, the the great times you've had in your career. Is there a particular game that will always stick in your memory because you loved it? I, I think. Um, I think the 85 Cup fight, there was three games that were really stuck in my head, but I think the 85 Cup final were, you know, that game, uh, Dundee United were favourites at 5-4 to four and Celtic were 74 second favourites. Yeah. And Dundee United were a great team, um, but the it came to the end of the game and we were drawing, David Proven scored a magnificent free kick just before the end. Can you tell me who scored for Dundee United? Uh, it was the wee midfield player. Um, I'll tell you before I answer this. Uh, he get the pass for Dodds and he slipped it in behind Packy Bonner. Uh, I know his name, but you have to tell me. BD. BD. That's right. Stuart, Stuart BD. Great player. Great, great team. In the United. The great manager, Jim McLean, wasn't well liked, but the best, one of the best, probably the top five managers ever in Scotland. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, there was two minutes to go, and um, and Roy Aiken, I love Big Roy, great player. He crossed the ball, and everybody said it was a great ball. But fifteen yards out for the goal, that's not a good ball. But I managed to. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case you're watching or listening, Roy. Roy was a brilliant player and a brilliant guy, and he crossed the ball, and he had side spin on the ball. And when I headed the ball, it was going by the post, and Hamish McAlpin sort of never went for it, and I had put side spin on it. I don't, know, I don't know, I, and I've never done that before, I don't know if the fans behind the goal sucked the ball in or I put side spin on it, but you have to w see that. And I went in and, and it was amazing that day because there was over 100,000 people at the game that day. Yeah. So there was, the, the crowd, it was unbelievable and that was a magical, a magical moment for me to give all the fans all that pleasure. Um, and I went in in the Monday after it, and uh, I said to David Hay, I says, um, I said, I'm in for a new contract, boss. And I said, I've just stopped you for getting the sack um, and things like that. I wonder if you could you could do for me. He said, well, Frank, to be honest with you, I want to play with Mo Johnson up front next year. I said, that's no problem. I'll play with him. Two guys can score goals. He said, no, I want Brian McClare to be playing with him. And I says, um, I says, oh, that's fine. And uh I said, I'll be sub and I'll make sure they two, you know, keep on the ball. He said, I want Alan McAnally to, uh, Alan McAnally to be um, the the sub. Wow. I said, so so you you want to play me? I said, why you want to play me in the second team? He said, because I've not got a third team. But, um, yeah. but no, I'm more kidding on about that. He never said after, that. He said, <laughs> you should do after dinner. You really um, should. Um, <laughs> he, said, uh, he said to me, uh, so I said, you don't want me? And... Um, he said, well, I've got the three players I want to play first. I said, well, that's okay. Uh, in other words, I'm up for transfer. He said, yeah. And, and that was it. And I walked out. And that was a very, very sad. Even if he'd have waited two weeks to tell me that, I would have been quite happy. But to tell me in the Monday morning. And I've spoke to Davy Hay about it. And a very honest guy. And I love Davy Hay. And he told me the truth. He said, I'm, 
he, he actually said, Frank, I made a wee mistake there. He said I should have kept you on another year at least. Yeah. He said, uh, age were you? I was 29. And I, prime. and I scored 22 goals that season, but only played half the games that Mo Johnson scored and Brian McClare. Brian McClare scored 24, Mo Johnson scored 23, and I scored 22, but I never played as many games as in that, that year. Yeah. So I, I was good for my, my 22 He's goals. He's good with the stats all these oh, years later. This fantastic. is incredible. This is unbelievable. Well, I, I, I find it unbelievable because I've been f- forgetting a lot of things I've done yesterday and I can remember back in 40 years. It's incredible. Yeah. Um, and listen, that was, I mean, absolutely magnificent as a career. Um, and then just when you think to yourself, oh, I, mean, I don't know how you would have coped with it, Ruffy. Somebody just turns around you. You're at the top of your game. You've scored in the cup final and then... Boom. Uh, do you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of sitting in Jimmy Johnson's house. And Jimmy Johnson said to me in an interview, Jock Steen took him in and said to him in 1975, that's it. And he said, and I walked out into the car park and just burst out crying. Wow. Yeah, I, th- I think it's a hard one to get your head around. If you know it's the end, then you know the end's coming, that's okay. But if you're not expecting it, and you you think you're in the top of your game, and then somebody tells you that you're no longer here because when you're at Rangers and Celtic, uh, it's an incredible experience. If Frank will tell you walking in that front door, and there's like two or three hundred supporters just there to see you going into training. Aye, you know it's something you once you're you're bred into it and you've got it in you to take that away from you. It's a hard one to get your head around. Yeah. Were you were you always first? I'm guessing you were. Were you always first choice of clubs that you were at, or did you ever have to wait? No, no, I was straight in, Aye. straight in the first. So, who were some of the goalies that you kept out of action? Because uh, there must be some good ones. Well, I was at clubs. Thistle for a long time, who so was there wasn't that many. None of, well, Billy Thompson was a young Billy Thompson Aye, at the he time. He was a good goalkeeper. Billy was good. And the rest you wouldn't remember because there were obviously guys that were retiring. Uh, Hibs, it was again Jim MacArthur who was at Hibs for a long time. So, not really anybody, to no. tell you the truth, no, you know. No, you know. Um, As far as your career, is there a story that sticks in your head, a mad story, Frank, that just, you know, either makes you laugh or... It's going to beat the soup, the well, soap story. <laughs> the soap story's up there. If you've got any hankies there, I would advise you to get them out. I always remember... The soap story's up there. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to tell you that story. It eventually has a good ending, but I was, um, I was staying in Balornock at the time. Uh, I played football up the back. Well, it can't have a worse end. <laughs> and, uh, uh, it wasn't that bad, uh, Tam. Um, so I was training at St Rocks. Um, I, I played for Colson, Colson United. I was training with uh, St Rocks. We used to go up to the lock. Um, we used to run to Royce Road up to the lock. What was the lock? That one up the up there, the end of Royce Road, ran up to there, trained, I was scoring all the goals, running back, I was first back to the training, done that for six weeks, and then we had a game on the Saturday, and I, I walked down, and um, I was in the dressing room, and there was only ten players, and I was like, ah, I'm going, and Wally O'Neill was the manager at the time, and uh, I said, there's only ten players in here, and I'm, I'm going to get a game today, and I was so excited, and I was like, I'm running about, and I was looking to see if there was any players coming, there was no players coming, couldn't believe it. Tam Cadbury at the time, he played up front and Wally O'Neill was the manager and I said, I'm going to get a game today. This is amazing. I said, I'm going to score today and show them what I can do. And Wally O'Neill came in and says, right, boys, and I had everything covered. Nobody could come in the car park, so I knew I was playing. I went, ah, oh, thank God. Wally O'Neill said, well, we've only got 10 players today, boys. And I thought he was going to say, introduce me and said, well, Frank, we'll have to come in and play. And he went, we'll just go with the 10 players. And, um... I walked out that dressing room and I walked down by the Red Road Flats and I walked up and I started crying and I said, I'm finished with football, I'm never going to play football again. I'd done my best and even with 10 players, I wouldn't get a game. But um, I managed to get a game with Coastside Rangers about four months later. Um, my first three managers were Sir Alec Ferguson um, at St Mirren and then I went with Bob Paisley and then I went with Jock Steen when I got my first cap so that was my first three managers wow. so um, my first three managers met and managed to dent the, the crying I'd done that day yeah, but I, I, I don't I, I never cried a lot I was a tough wee guy I never cried but that really hurt me yeah. The great names of professionals, well, Tam Cadbury, you remember him? Great name, in it, And well, at a time, and a, a great professional as well, because, well, a, a lot of players uh, were going into pubs and getting bevied, you know. I always remember that Cadbury only had a glass and a half of milk in every bar. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I'm, I'm stopping. I'm, I'm resigning. I'm resigning. I was fighting for 10 minutes there. That's a chocolate joke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. Oh, dear. Cause, cause uh, thanks for being here, Frank. I was just, uh, I was just about to say, because the, the longer I went on, I thought to myself, there's got to be a punchline in this story. I do remember uh, him, though. You remember him, I? Uh, Aye. Great yes, names yes, that you're coming yeah, up with. Yeah, right. So, uh, the, you've scored a few goals. Is the best goal the Cup final goal out? Uh, the only reason I'm saying this, and I don't know if you remember this, but at Celtic Park one day. <laughs> St. Ma- St. Mirren St. Mirren You got a standing ovation At half time I'll never ever forget it Because you must have beaten About five or six players Before rifling it From about 30 yards Into the roof of the net right. and, and, and they gave you a, Everybody gave you A standing what ovation What happened in the game Was a beat of, It was about three or four play, I played four players But what happened was I, I was halfway down I managed to get back up and the the jungle loved guys that wouldn't go down, go up and try and get a goal. And they loved me. I was nearly down. Abercrombie came in and done me. Beckett came in and done me. <laughs> I get back up and I ran by John Young. And the ball bobbled. If you if you see the ball, yep. it bobbles. I touch up and I volleyed it into the top corner. And I, I was like, ah, I couldn't believe it. And I ran to the Celtic fans. And then I went back to the halfway line. And the Celtic fans were still cheering, so I gave them a wave again, and another big roar went up, and for the first time in my life, my stomach went sore. It was, what, what, what do you call that again, when you're nervous? And you're the adrenaline. Tar- uh, no, no, no adrenaline. You're Emotion. Upset, upset stomach. Diarrhea. Well, <laughs> I had a, well, I had a upset stomach uh, because uh, I couldn't believe that that had happened. Celtic, the jungle accepted me. That was the day they accepted me. And I was overwhelmed at this. And I went in to the dressing room and Big Billy, what he used to do was if he were playing well and scored a good goal, he would try and get into you for the other games he played badly. Yeah. And, it's, and I went in to be into the toilet. And Big Bully said, me, for you, Frank, and all I heard was me being sick in the toilet. And the whole dressing room just burst into laughter. We, they were all laughing. Nothing else was saved. And, and I came in, I was sick. I had an upset stomach because of the crowd. And I came back and uh, went out and won 7 nothing that game. That just shows you... Are you sure it was 7 nothing. 7 nothing. Are you sure? Definitely 7 I was going to ask you, who, do you remember the guy who scored for St Mirren? Oh, Charlie Nicholas scored. Uh, no, uh, Alec Beckett was yes. it scored a wonder goal for St. Martin. Alec Beckett, what seven a goal! One. Uh, seven what one. A, I said you're right. Sir. Seven one. No, was it? Yeah, seven one. Alec no, Be- that, that was seven nothing that game. No, no, seven one. Well, you can check it up. Uh, I'll check it up. We'll have an argument about it. Listen, um, if you if there was a goal, Tam, that you would love to have scored in history, is there one that sticks out in your mind? Uh, I'll tell you one, and you'll remember it vividly. I don't know why it sprung to mind there, but it must have been scored when I was maybe 10 years old or 11 years old. And up to that point, including Archie Gemmels at the World Cup, maybe a year oh, or so really? later, it was the best I'd ever seen because it was spectacular. It was a volley. It was on the turn. It was scored in a game Norwich City versus Liverpool, what and it was goal. scored Just by what a goal. In fashion. What a goal. The, the way he did it, you know what I think it was great about Justin, of course, who would later very colourful character, of course, and dating Julie Goodyear, aka Bet Lynch for Coronation Street, coming up to Scotland, Airdrie and Hearts, and all the rest of it. But the 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 cool reaction to the goal. I mean, he, he did it on the turn. He kind of flipped it up with one foot. On the spin and then whacked it past Ray Clements. It was at Carroll Road, yeah? Yep. And uh, right. it was away. If you watch it again, no right celebration position. or anything. He just kind of walks away. He just gets all puffed up and he just walks away and you thought, wow. And, and that was, I think, at that point, and as being a young football fan, that would have been the year, in fact, I got my first season ticket at Motherwell. You were just kind of falling in love with the game and see to see a That's goal right. like that. It still actually gives me goosebumps when I watch it again. Yeah. I think Norwich had the V neck with the green and yellow yep. stripes yep. on yep. it when, they, right, yeah. when they scored that goal. Uh, Ruffy, is there a goal that you would have loved to have scored? Oh, well, I'd have to, have to go with the one that Tam touched on. Uh, the goals that uh, somebody scores that remember forever, and it has to be Archie Gemmel. Yeah. You know, what were you I'd actually thinking? I've never goal. heard it from your perspective. When you're at the other end of the park there, mm-hmm. right? Now, we've all just seen the wee flurry action up there and heard, to be fair, there, maybe David Coleman, I know Archie McPherson get the, the big guy out of train spotting and all the rest of it. But yeah. David Coleman's, I think, uh, is the, the ultimate. 
commentary and that uh, goal that we've all heard a million times. But what were you actually thinking as you're watching it doing the other end of the pitch? Well, I think we all knew what we had to do. We knew it was a bit goal difference. And uh, if you get a chance to watch that game, in the first half of that game, we actually hit the post twice. Aye, you know, aye. we should have been in a couple of goals up. So there was always a possibility it was going to happen. But uh, obviously it never happened. But that goal in particular, I mean, that, that'll last forever and ever. So if you'd scored that goal, it'd be... A memory forever. Yeah, Frank. They they two goals are magnificent. That uh, goal, Alan's talking about. What a goal that was! And Scotland still had a chance. He had to get four one. They needed another goal. I always remember watching that. And the same with Tam. That was a magnificent goal at, at the time. It was his goal of the season. Everything. Uh, two the two of them. Two magnificent goals. But I remember when I was eleven, and uh, and. Uh, I went to Celtic Park a few times uh, into the jungle, and um, and I loved uh, watching football. I loved playing football. Um, I was so enthusiastic about it. But I always remember the '67 Cup final um, against Inter Milan, where. I watched that game and I was so frustrated that Celtic were the better team. They got a penalty, a dodgy penalty. They scored for it. Italian teams then, they just couldn't lose any goals. I was saying Celtic are going to get beat. There were chance after chance after chance. And then Celtic go forward. Was it Jim Craig that just rolls the ball in to Tommy Gemmo? Yep. And he thumps it in. And as soon as I hit that net, I jumped and my head nearly hit the ceiling. And I was... I was just overcome yeah. with that goal. And see, after that, I said, I, I wouldn't mind being a football player. And it's like it's like you there, Tam, saying, I wanted that, gave me great enthusiasm Aye. for football. To see these wonderful things happening in the football park, that's so important for the young people. Yeah. Can I ask something about that uh, 67 European Cup final that I've never known? Was that live on the telly here? Yes. And if so, at what time? Well, I remember watching it at school. I remember our, our school, whoever was the headmaster was, took us all into a room and we watched it uh, in, Is that at right? school. I didn't know yeah. you'd be in a janitor as well. So it was just, it was on, was it BBC? Was it? It must have been, STV? yeah. Oh, no, it would have been black and white, obviously. It would have been, it would have been BBC. Uh, white, uh, obviously. What I'm amazed at is that Frank was living in a prefab. How could his, <laughs> <laughs> how could his head hit the ceiling oh. in that house? Uh, nevertheless, that's a good one. Good goal. Uh, mine would have been a game you played in, Ruffy. Uh, it must be Kenny Roglic. It's got to be 1977 Anfield, where the header, yeah. the, I don't know why Wales agreed to giving yeah. the Tartan Army a whole wad of tickets, yeah. but it looked yeah. like a home game, and yeah. Kenny's header was magnificent. Well, that that header might never ever have happened if I'd decided to throw the ball out to the left hand side of the park. <laughs> Rather <laughs> Martin Buckingham. I was 50 50 whether I was going to start the build up for that end or that end, but fortunately I put it out to Martin Buckingham. Yeah, is that one of the best atmospheres you've ever played in apart from Yeah, that? I think no, if, you get if you get No, no, if you get a chance to see that, the supporters are right behind the net and the goal. Aye. Yeah. Right behind the net. The you know, there was, no, there was no security, there was nothing. Uh, yeah. Obviously, the, the game at Wembley in '77, when there was a hundred thousand supporters, Scottish supporters at that game, yeah, uh, it's hard to beat as well. But uh, they're wonderful nights. Here's one thing I, I forgot to ask you, yeah. and, and, and because you're a fanatical Motherwell fan, is there a do you collect do you collect anything any memorabilia? I mean, nah. a strip or anything that you know sticks what? I, in your I mind? I give it away. I've did bits and pieces down through the years. Um, programs for big games. I've had uh, as, as thank yous, things that you've done for the club. Yeah, they might be even giving you a, a souvenir jersey or something. And invariably, it was a rake it went to my mate's uh, young boy who, at least thankfully, he, he he never misses a game now home and away. And I've given it to him. I've just never ever Nothing. collected anything. But I was I was over the moon. Um, and I, I went through a, a trip up uh, several months ago now um, for the Hearts Aberdeen quarter final in the League Cup. And uh, I was doing a wee turn through there in the, the Gorgie suite. And a guy who was there, he'd heard me on the radio talking quite a while, but I get slated by Hibs fans for it who think I was some sympathiser with Hearts and all that. But as always, explain to folk, my association with Hearts was that Hearts was our first game back after we lost Phil O'Donnell at Motherwell, you yeah. know. And Hearts were magnificent as a club with Motherwell, with the fans and all the rest of it when we played our Scottish Cup tie there early January 2008. And uh, so I'd always mentioned that in the radio and stuff and mentioned it in print and newspaper columns. And when I was out at this uh, do recently, the guy out in nowhere, and I thought, I'll definitely get a good home frame. He found me half a dozen 
uh, match programmes from that game, Hearts against Mullow. And as I've even explained to you before, Peter, it wasn't actually like a match programme that day. Hearts had a, it was a, a black front cover, just with Phil O'Donnell's almost like an etched a portrait of him on the front yeah. and inside rather than adverts and fixtures and reserve team news it was just all tributes to Motherwell and Hearts uh, greats present and past at the time who had a wee paragraph each on Phil O'Donnell uh, and the guy had these he'd had them for years and he says would you like these Tom so uh-huh. I know for a fact that when it comes up to you know it the best way with these things, Peter, you try to cash in in a good way and an anniversary when there's a, a the next big anniversary that comes up with the, the tragic passing of Phil O'Donnell. I'll bring these along at an event and I'll hopefully raise a right few bob, you know. But I, there been so many things in the past that I do wish I'd held on to, but the only thing I actually do hold on to to half answer your question is uh, uh, ticket stubs from, from gigs for uh, concerts, yeah, but no for football, no. yeah, and you keep them. Keep yeah. them all. You, you know me, Ruffy. I'm a hoarder. Uh, Ruffy, um, kind guy that he is, soft guy that he is, he gave me his Scotland jersey from Scotland against Brazil in the Maracanã. Oh, wow. Uh, which is, uh, how many How many were in the stadium, Ruffy? There was 135,000 wow. in the stadium. That well, that shirt must be worth at least £50,000. Yeah. Oh, he Particularly in a... He, he got 60 for it. <laughs> 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 and it'll be even worth more than what? A year or yeah. so. <laughs> exactly. Talking about when he dies. Uh, listen, I'm going to finish on. I'm going to finish on a, a quick. Uh, we always like to do something a wee bit out of left field, nothing to do with right, football, just to it. get your thoughts on it. Um, well, I come to you last, Frank, because you want. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go to you. Thinking time. I'll go to you last. So you get thinking time. I, is there a particular event in history that you would, if I could transport you back in a DeLorean, Ruffy, you'd like to be there? I had no, I can answer that question and for don't jump in right away when I say <laughs> because there is an ulterior motive. I would love to have been in Marlon Monroe's bread room. A bread room. Bread room. Yeah, bread room. <laughs> the <laughs> night, the <laughs> night she role. died. Yeah. <laughs> she was a bit I'd, love, I'd love to have been in that bedroom to see what actually happened. Yeah, because ah, you ah. are a conspiracy theorist, aren't yes. you? The other one would be obviously John F. Kennedy, but particularly her uh, there's too many things going on in the background in that one I'd love to know the real truth of that one yeah well that's a good one that's a good one Tom well you know this is quite dark and quite macabre in a way but um, 9-11 is a story that has always fascinated me I've watched every potential documentary I bought a book about 9-11 in Waterstones just last week uh, latest one it had come out um, about 9-11 it's a story that utterly fascinated me and I think particularly because I was in New York and I was up the World Trade Center one month before it happened right yeah. and there's a bit of me that would like just to have seen everything about that first hand and I don't mean seeing people that had died and that and the thousands that did but to have been my being like upper Manhattan that day and just to see what the, the feeling was like, what the, the camaraderie was like, what the feeling with the people, what the, the mood of the city was like when something as massive happened. And I'm a, I am apologise that that's no, maybe a, a, a light one and maybe a funny one, but it's a story in history that has always fascinated me. And I can't watch enough about it. And I just wonder, what would it have been like to have been there that day and the folk gathered around the ticker tape in Times Square and kind of watching it unfold uh, down at the, the southern tip of uh, Manhattan. It must have just been an incredible day. Yeah, and just a, a slight footnote to that is obviously I've got lots of cousins yep, over there, yep. and one of them, um, who was a private detective, Joe, he actually had a flat because he was a multimillionaire and he's still, thankfully, alive and kicking, but he had a flat uh, on right on the... at, at, at the uh, at the river, and they thought they were being attacked. Aye. Aye. They, that, that's, that, that's the only thing On a about slightly that, lighter note I would like to go back to New York And buy a pint For one of the guys Involved that day Whose story I'll never forget He worked in the World Trade Centre When everything absolutely kicked off Maybe even by the point of the second plane Crashing in His wife phoned him to see that he was okay, he answered the phone, he says, ah, yeah, I'm absolutely fine, I'm at work, you know, and she says, you're fine, you know what I mean, and it turns out the guy had answered the phone, he was oblivious to that, he'd left his wife that morning, and gone and visited his mistress, mm-hmm. elsewhere, and when he'd picked up his phone yeah. to answer, 
he's in bed with a good lady and he's acting a blood. He, he was unaware that everything had happened, and yeah. that was how we get caught. Yeah, well, that, that's what I call a, a fairly legitimate affair. I think um, I'd be happy with that one. I, I'm with you, Ruffy. I think for me, it would be Kennedy. I'd love to be an elevated position with a drone just to get where everybody was and where the other smoking gun was. Um, Frank, the last word on our podcast is with you. I have to say the two stories are amazing and I would love to have been there as well. But I would probably rather go back to thirteen fourteen when the English invaded Scotland. They were 3 to 1 against the Scottish troops they had much more armoury than was that the, the Scottish or just <laughs> that's what I was thinking <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was the odds I was on a bit and then Ladbrokes end didn't we <laughs> if you don't mind boys I'll let you speak <laughs> <laughs> sorry on you go Frank <laughs> but I can't believe I get interrupted there but anyway what was the story I was telling you 13, uh, 14, 14, 14 and Bannockburn very good Alan um, but I would have loved to be there you know they had Three times as many troops as the Scottish. They had all the armoury and Scotland sent them home to think again. Well, that is magnificent, by the way. And don't forget, next week on the podcast, Frank McGarvey will be reading Robbie Burns' poetry uh, for us <laughs> uh, for a full hour and a half. That is a, a magnificent story. <laughs> <laughs> he said to me, let me finish on an event in history. And I thought, there's a gag, there's going to be <laughs> hilarity at the end of it. But no, uh, in the end, uh, it's been a great uh, podcast. Hope you enjoyed the, the, the stories from Frank McGarvey. Absolutely superb, wonderful career, uh, laden with medals and, of course, uh, some great memories as well. And, of course, Ruffy and Tam Cowan on top for him. Uh, do join us. Do, in fact, follow us on the podcast uh, right across all the platforms for the audio version and you can go to at PLZ Soccer on YouTube and you'll be able to watch the programme as well and you can see the clobber uh, that Frank's got on today and if you're of course uh, a fashionista of the 70s you can maybe get a bit emotional about an old Simon shirt that very few people wear nowadays but Tam and if you don't if you don't get sponsorship now for Cadbury's you never will (laughs) exactly and on that note thank you very much for listening and watching